Senator Joseph Lieberman was born in 1942 in Stamford, Connecticut, to a family of Jewish immigrants. By 2000, he had become the first Jew ever to be nominated as a major party's candidate for the office of the Vice President of the United States. Senator Lieberman was first elected to the Connecticut Senate in 1970 and then served as the Attorney General of Connecticut. Next, Senator Lieberman set his sights on Washington and was elected to the United States Senate in 1988, where he became known as the moral conscience of the Senate. In 2000, Senator Lieberman was nominated the Democratic candidate for Vice President of the United States. Earlier this year, Senator Lieberman retired from the Senate after 25 years of distinguished service in which he chaired leading committees and earned the lasting admiration of his colleagues from across the political spectrum. Throughout his remarkable career in public life, Senator Joseph Lieberman stood out for many things. His work ethic, his bipartisanship, his fight for civil rights, and his clear moral compass. But more than anything, Senator Lieberman stood out for his fiercely proud Jewish identity. From the Connecticut General Assembly to the United States Senate to the presidential campaign trail, Senator Lieberman never compromised on the values instilled in him by his parents and grandparents. In the harsh glare of the public spotlight, Senator Lieberman held tight to his own inner light. His Shabbat observance became legendary and his kosher diet became the talk at water coolers around the nation. From praying in talat and tefillin aboard Air Force One to proudly kissing his mezuzah before the press photographers, Senator Joseph Lieberman became one of the greatest icons of Kiddush Hashem this nation has ever seen. But more important than what he showed the world is what Senator Lieberman demonstrated to a generation of young American Jews, that a person can reach the very pinnacles of success and still be a proud and practicing Jew, and that even when standing in the Oval Office, one still stands before God. As someone who so proudly and consistently celebrates his Judaism, Senator Lieberman was always attracted to the kindred spirits in Chabad. Early in his career, Senator Lieberman developed a close personal relationship with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe blessed the Senator to be a source of pride for the Jewish people. Going to Washington this afternoon, and I'm going to take the oath on Tuesday, and I wanted very much to come by and ask for your bracha as I go forward. It's a great opportunity and a great responsibility to do whatever I can you for Kiddush Hashem. You my bracha in the double party today. I would much bless you to be much success, successful in your new position and to be a great source of pride for the Jewish people in general. Thank you, I'm going to try my best. Throughout his travels in office and on the campaign trail, Senator Lieberman also developed a warm relationship with scores of shluchim he met fostering Jewish life and igniting flames in the furthest corners of the globe. Please welcome the Honorable Senator Joseph Lieberman. Thank you. I accept your nomination. Uh, <laughs> old habits, you know. Uh, although I will tell you this, this is probably the largest crowd I've had the honor to address since I accepted the vice presidential nomination in Los Angeles in 2000. And unlike that experience, this will not end with a recount or hanging chads. The only thing hanging tonight are hanging tzitzis. And that's much better. I, I thank uh, all of you uh, for your warm welcome. I thank uh, Rabbi Kudlarski and uh, those who prepared that video for that um, wonderful tribute that means the, the world to me. Um, I'm honored to be here tonight, particularly because I'm at a, a different stage of my life. And uh, the words of the Rabbi resonate differently in different parts of one's life. I find that um, I don't like it when people say, are you enjoying your retirement? Uh, 
somebody uh, actually sent me, you know, I get a lot of jokes, and one of my college classmates said, in case you're looking for a job at your age, I want you to send you this story about an older man looking for a job interviewed by a lady from the human resources department of, of the company he was looking to, and she says, sir, what would you say is your greatest weakness? And he says, I'm too honest. And she says, I don't think honesty is a weakness. And he says, I don't care what you think. <laughs> but but the, the Rebbe had a much more profound insight, and it's why I'm so happy to be here tonight. As you know, I'm sure the Rebbe said, the idea of retirement is rooted in modern society's notion that life is composed of productive and non-productive periods. The time to passively enjoy the fruits of one's labor does indeed have its time and place in the world to come. So here, every day of life, God gives us the opportunity to get something more done. I know you live by that creed, and I will say to you tonight on this day that I am profoundly grateful that you have given me the opportunity uh, to speak with you at this extraordinary kinos of Shluchim. I want to thank Rabbi Kutlarski for his kind words, for his extraordinary work, he really is the one who has overseen, as I know it, the, the remarkable expansion of Shluchim around the world. I used to say that Chabad was sending out more Shluchim than McDonald's was opening new hamburger places. He's way beyond that now. Uh, I also, and, and here I have to be careful what I say, I once said that it seemed to me, uh, as somebody involved in national security matters, that Chabad actually was developing a larger worldwide organization than the CIA. <laughs> Tonight, we're honored to have with us the former director of the CIA, a dear friend of mine, Jim Wolsey. So, so thank you, Rabbi Kutlarski, for everything you've done in the name and with the inspiration of the Rebbe to spread the word of, and, and light of Chabad uh, throughout the world. I thank the leaders of Agudas Hasidi Chabad, Rabbi Yehuda Krinsky and Rabbi Avram Shemto. I thank all of the shluchim and uh, because really, and I'll have more to say about each of you, um, I particularly want to thank the two shluchim who had the uh, difficult responsibility of, of taking care of me over the last several years, Rabbi Yisrael Darren, my hometown Shalia, from Stamford, Connecticut. I could say many things about Rabbi Darren, all of them good, but one I will tell you is that uh, Every Motzei Shabbos, when I was not in town, and even when I was, he and his rabbits and Vivi would come by my mother's house and make Havdalah with her and talk with her. And that was... I actually ended up feeling that uh, my mother adopted uh, Yisrael Darren, and uh, in some sense, he adopted her, which means that we're brothers, which means that I'm related to half the people in this room. <laughs> right? I'm here tonight really because Rabbi Yisrael Darren asked me to be here. And I knew if I didn't say yes, my mother would uh, really be very upset about it. Um, from Olam Haba. I also want to recognize and thank the other shaliach in the other city that I lived for 24 years, Rabbi Levi Shemtov. Rabbi Shemtov has uh, really taken care and elevated the spirituality in Washington. I sometimes called him the Chabad ambassador to Washington. I would say to you really that there's not a better ambassador in the diplomatic corps in Washington than Rabbi Levi Shemtov. 
I thank all the shluchim who are here, so many of whom have been so good to me as I've traveled uh, the country and uh, the world. And um, I thank particularly all of you who are their supporters who are here tonight, their balabatim, without whom they could not do the extraordinary work that they do. I will say more in a minute about uh, all the great work that the Shluchim do uh, for the people in their communities all around the world, but I, I cannot help tell a few stories of my own about my meetings with the Shluchim. And uh, if you've heard these before, I apologize, but I love the stories so much, I'm gonna tell them anyway. In, in 2000, when I ran for vice president, uh, the Secret Service would keep the hotel where I was staying secret. It was classified for security reasons. But somehow, in city after city, when I'd arrive in this secret location and go to my hotel room, there was a kosher meal waiting from the local Chabad Shaliach. <laughs> and the only way I could explain that, Director Woolsey, was that Chabad had one of its own placed high up in the United States Secret Service. I, I still think that's possible. My second favorite story is that I was at a security conference with my friend John McCain, who you saw pictured there at the Kotel, uh, in February of 2004 in Munich, Germany. And um, th there was a, a vast protest against the Iraq war at that time. There were literally 100,000 people protesting in the streets of Munich. And they surrounded the street on which the hotel where the conference was over the weekend, over Shabbat, uh, with the military tanks. And anyway, they opened the tanks. Our bus went in. We had a delegation. There was a, a military liaison that went forward to prepare the hotel for us. As I went into the hotel, a, a Marine uh, corporal came out and said to me, he had to explain something to me that a, a miraculous event that occurred that afternoon. I said, what happened, Colonel? He said, uh, they asked me to come out of the hotel. I looked down the street, the tanks separated, and a young man uh, in a black hat with a beard and a long coat came out carrying a bag. And, uh, <laughs> He said, uh, I have this for Senator Lieberman. It's been checked, there's nothing to worry about. Well, it turned out that um, it was challahs and, and kosher wine and food for Shabbat. And I said, I called the shaliach in Munich uh, after Shabbos and I said, how did this happen? Well, you must have told your mother you were coming to Munich <laughs> this Shabbos. She told Rabbi Darren, Rabbi Darren emailed me, you know, the rest. Anyway, the, so you don't think my only experiences with Chabad around the world have been gastronomical. I will just tell you this theological story. I was traveling in 2002 through Central Asia after the uh, Gulf, uh, after the Af Afghan war. And um, we ended up unexpectedly, because of bad weather, in uh, Tashkent, Uzbekistan, on what was the day of my father's yurt site. We came in late at night, and I said to the um, embassy personnel, I explained my father's yurt site, et cetera, and I, I had no idea whether there was a shul in Tashkent. Uh, don't worry about it. They called the Chabad Shaliach. I went the next morning. Not only was there a shul, but the, really there were 40 people there, davening chakras, a beautiful building where there was a day school. I give my credit to Lev Levayev, who I found out later was the cause of, of that. I want to, uh, I was thinking that uh, Lahabdil, that there used to be a movement in the world called communism. It's now where it belongs on the ash heap of history. Uh, but it had a slogan in the manifesto Marx wrote, which is workers of the world unite. Uh, tonight, I think I can say the Rebbe Shluchim of the world have united here in Brooklyn. <laughs> for a cause. And this movement will be eternal because it is founded on principles that are uh, eternal. 
the reality is uh, that um, I, I came to Chabad, if I may reminisce a little bit about the privileges that I had to hear the Rebbe, to interact with him on a few occasions. In the 1960s, when a friend from New Haven first brought me to a Fabrengen, and I was um, moved. I'd never been to anything like it. At that time, there, were, um, there, were, there was translation uh, of what the Rebbe was saying, because my Yiddish was not that good. I was deeply impressed by the spirituality, by the extraordinary scholarship uh, of the Rebbe and by the devotion, by the attentiveness of the Hasidim there, and by the joy, also as the evening went on, by the intellectual and physical energy and stamina of the Rebbe himself, who continued to bring out of himself, essentially as I could see without a note, the most deeply spiritual and profound uh, insights. And so I, I went home and I, I studied the, the life of the Rebbe. I learned that he had um, obviously been born in, in Europe, had studied um, Jewish texts deeply, and also had studied secular texts, had studied at the University of Berlin and at the Sorbonne, had a degree in electrical engineering, es escaped from France just before the Nazis came in and came and joined his father-in-law of blessed memory, the previous Rebbe. He was a great teacher and a great leader. He was a great theological leader and also a secular leader. He built the core of, of a following but was constantly reaching out and pushing his Hasidim to reach out. And at the heart of it all was spirituality and uh, a tremendous intellect. Rav Salvechik, as you probably know, a great scholar in, in his own right, um, after a meeting with the Rebbe, uh, said, according to a, a rabbi who was with him, of the Rebbe, that he was a goan, which I would translate as a genius, that he was a great one, a leader uh, in Israel. That's, uh, that's a tribute that's deserved and coming from whence it comes adds uh, additional meaning to it. I went back to Connecticut as I settled in New Haven. Um, I met Rabbi Maurice Hecht, who probably was the Rebbe's first shaliach in uh, Connecticut. Uh, <laughs> Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yesel Gopin in, in West Hartford, uh, of course, Rabbi Zalman Morozov then was in, and Rabbi Dara, needless to say. In the, um, I, I went back to many more Fabrengans in my time, and uh, extraordinary people there, leaders in politics, leaders in religion, Eli Wiesel, Rav Salvechik. Uh, during the 70s, at one point, when I became Senate Majority Leader in Connecticut, I was particularly um, honored to receive a letter from the Rebbe, which I suppose one of the shluchim in Connecticut had arranged, in which the Rebbe quoted from the famous words from Yirmiyahu, the prophet Jeremiah, seek the welfare of the city and pray to God for it, for in its peace you shall have peace. Um, that directive, that outreach was uh, very important uh, to me. I went to the Rebbe before um, my marriage to Hadassah Freilich, and got a beautiful bracha. I'm very honored to say that my son-in-law, Daniel, is here, Daniel Lowenstein, and his brother, Ellie. And I'm sure this would please the Rebbe, uh, Bisha'a Tova. At the end of this month, honey, we'll have a baby, and this will mean that she will have three under the age of three. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> uh, I went to the Rebbe as the film showed before I was sworn into the Senate that, that a meeting occurred on my way to LaGuardia Airport to go to Washington because I couldn't think of a better way to give me direction, to give me a chizuk, to give me a bracha than to go to the Rebbe and it, that bracha carried me through uh, 24 years.
I could speak at too much length to the Rebbe, and in, to a certain extent, this is like carrying coals to Newcastle here, but I want to say to you um, what his leadership meant to me, which is that he, he, he was a leader with a mission, and that was to spiritualize the world, to convince people uh, through acts of kindness and goodness to bring the world as close as we possibly could in our time uh, to perfection. And to do it one by one, mitzvah by mitzvah, and this is what your, your dear shluchim take with you throughout America and throughout the world. I was fascinated at one point way back when a friend of mine who is a member of a reform temple said to me that he was surprised that the Jewish leaders in, in town who he felt most respected him were the uh, Chabad, was the Chabad Shaliach. Uh, and the, in other words, he felt put off and judged by others. But from the Shaliach, uh, he got the message, uh, not of anger and judgmentalism about what mitzvahs you're not doing, but let's talk about what mitzvah you're gonna do next. And so came the Rebbe's campaigns for, thank you. The Rebbe's campaigns for putting on tefillin. I remember before I uh, held national office, and I was in New York once, and uh, one of the shluchim came up to me on the streets of Manhattan and said, have you put on tefillin today? And I said, yes. And he looked at me and said, really? <laughs> I said, no, yes, I have. Uh, the, the lighting of candles, very important. Um, I'll tell you this story from my 2000 campaign. The, we, we flew after the uh, convention was over from Los Angeles to Wisconsin. The Gores and we were going to go on a, a steamboat down the Mississippi River. And it turned out to be Thursday night and Friday morning. We had uh, the Secret Service, the campaign had a new kind of responsibility. They had to find the place where the, the closest place where there was a shoal. And they found a shoal in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, but then they had to provide for Shabbat, and there was a woman on the campaign staff who was Jewish, totally secular, who, uh, where else she found a, uh, a shaliach in Minnesota, I believe it was Rabbi Green, and um, he, he pro and she told us this story. Uh, I, I told him we needed kosher food, we needed all that was necessary for Shabbat, and he provided everything, he drove the whole way himself, and I said, to him, Rabbi, what do I owe you? And he said, I don't want any money. I just want to ask you this. When Mrs. Lieberman lights the Shabbos candles tonight, I want you, please, as payment to me, to light the Shabbos candles. That's a beautiful story. She had never done it before. And it moved uh, Hadassah and me. So the Rebbe left an enormous body of learning and inspiration, but remember, he was a person of action and leadership. He um, knew and taught that while we pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and ask the help of God, um, ultimately, we have to act ourselves here. So the Lubavitch movement, under the inspiration and leadership of the Rebbe, as you know, was really the first to reach out inside the former Soviet Union to try to bring the light of Torah and Yiddishkeit into an area that was extremely dark. And I think those candles that Chabad lit in the former Soviet Union ultimately passed from candle to candle are what brought about, helped certainly to bring about the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of communism. I was in Australia for the first time this year. I had a wonderful visit. I noticed that a disproportionate number of rabbis at the shuls there were Chabad. And I asked about it, and they said it was because the rabbi, before anyone else, um, made a judgment I, that, that this was a, a country that uh, shluchim should go to and that uh, the light should be brought there, the light of Torah. Uh, and of course, uh, many, many survivors of the Shoah went there, are leaders of the community, and again, the lights were lit first by 
um, Chabad and Shluchim. I speak about Israel for a moment because the Rebbe has been, uh, was a, a very strong uh, supporter of Israel in ways that uh, may have surprised some, but, but n not those who, who followed uh, the writings, the work, the speaking of the Rebbe. Uh, he said very clearly that those who serve in the Israeli Defense Forces are doing a mitzvah. And that's worth um, remembering uh, today to protect the Jewish state. The Rebbe was not involved in partisan politics, but when he felt that something was happening in Israeli politics that he should speak about, uh, that mattered to the Jewish people, to Torah, he didn't hesitate, and it had an effect. And at least in one case, it elected a prime minister of Israel, and, and, a, and a great prime minister uh, at that. This legacy uh, speaks to us today, and speaks to each one of you, shluchim, who continue the work of the Rebbe today. I found in reading over the first talk that the Rebbe gave when he became the Rebbe, the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1950, these words, our faith demands that everyone must do good on his own and not depend on his Rebbe. Don't deceive yourselves into thinking I will lead and you will engage in singing songs and toasting l'chaim and that will be enough. Notice the Rebbe didn't say don't sing songs and toast l'chaim. He said, just don't think it will be enough. Each of you has your own load, your own battle. I do not decline from helping, but nothing, even heaven, can replace personal responsibility. You have taken up that call year after year with increasing devotion, the remarkable expansion of Chabad since Gimel Tamos. Uh, speaks to the greatness of uh, a leader and speaks to the commitment that you have. I once said to Rabbi Darren, Rabbi Israel Darren, I have to make that clear because there's a lot of Rabbi Darrens here tonight, that it strikes me as I meet Shluchim around the world that this is a remarkably gifted, talented group of people, uh, unusually so, um, personable, uh, great teachers, uh, and, and it's remarkable to me when you think about it because you come from a relatively small pool of people, which is to say the Chabad Lubavitch community. And Rabbi Dern said, and I think wisely, there's nothing unique particularly about all of us except that we are inspired, motivated, driven every day of our lives to honor the memory of the Rebbe, a blessed memory. And I think he's right um, when he says that. I want to say, I want to compliment you and congratulate you for a quality that probably people don't usually associate with you, but I do, which is your fearlessness. One of the worst moments in Jewish history recorded in the Torah is the report that the Maraglim, the scouts, brought back from Eretz Yisrael to Moshe Rabbeinu and, and B'nai Yisrael, when they said in that pitiful sentence, they saw giants there, we are to ourselves like insects or grasshoppers, and we are to them also. Um, they had no self-confidence, they had no understanding, even though they had seen the miraculous acts of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, that uh, they could achieve the task. You shluchim, wherever you are sent, big city, small town, a lot of Jews, very few Jews, um, beautiful weather or cold weather, you go forward fearlessly with confidence because you know you have a mission to perform. And, and you do it beautifully. As a result, there is no movement in, in uh, Jewry today like this movement. Um, you have built Chabad houses, 
preschools. Two of my grandchildren have been there. You have to be at a Passover, a, a Pesach Seder with, a, with a, my granddaughter who was at a Chabad, a child care center on the west side when she gets up on the chair at age three and says, it's wonderful to celebrate the Yetziat Mitzrayim, but we're not going to be really happy, says to me, until we really build the base Hamigdosh. That's... <laughs> And everything you do is with joy. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going on too long, and you know, this is the danger when you give a senator out of office a microphone. I mean, I, I want to just uh, leave you, uh, as, uh, really the first part I want to say is really, I should just say amen to what Rabbi Kutlarski said. With all that you've done, there is obviously, as you know, more to do. This week's Parsha um, records the dream of Yaakov Avino, Jacob, our father. Uh, and this memorable uh, vision of angels ascending and descending. In some sense, I think in, in world Jewry today, we need you, shluchim, as angels of Hashem, to um, bring people in and in another sense bring people out. And I want to explain briefly what I mean. I won't labor the point, but the uh, recent Pew study of, of a portrait of Jewish Americans showed a remarkable decline and disappearance of non Orthodox Jews. And what's really painful about this is that it is not occurring because America is pushing Jewish people to lose their identity. I'll just say this in one sentence. I was honored to run for Vice President of the United States, the first Jewish person to do that. Everybody knew I was an Orthodox Jew. It didn't have a negative effect at all. It probably had, had a positive effect because people respected the fact that I was observant. And yet, and yet today, people are choosing, Jews are choosing of their own volition, not forced, to leave Judaism. The work that you do is some of the most important work in bringing Jews back in. And I tell you, I agree with Rabbi Kudlarski. I'm not, um, I'm not a pessimist about this. I, I've been alive long enough, and I've studied Jewish history enough, and I have enough emunah to know, and I don't see a belief, but to know that the Jewish people are an eternal people. We're going to exist forever. And really the question is, which of us will choose to be part of that continuity? There's that magnificent uh, moment in uh, Megillus Esther, which of course in my house we call Megillus Hadassah, when, as you know, Mordechai sends the message into her that Haman is going to kill the Jewish people, and she resists at first. She's nervous. And he sends, I'm paraphrasing, of course, he sends back another message saying, don't think if you stay quiet, um, you, you and your family is going to be treated any different than any of the other Jews. He says that famous sentence, which is the most famous, perhaps it is for this reason you were brought to the palace, this moment. That's a very important sentence, and it's one that we should all ask ourselves all the time. But me, for me, more and more, it's another sentence in what Mordechai says that really sticks with me, which is that he says to Esther, if you don't act to save your people, someone else will come along to save your people. Uh, and to me, that's the truth, that uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a promise. We're an eternal people. And the question is, which of us will choose to keep this going? And of course, you have chosen um, by your work, dear Shluchim and those who support you, to do exactly that. So I urge you to go on. I urge you to go on in America, throughout the world, in Israel. You have a special mission in Israel. Remember that this is a great Jewish state, a strong Jewish state, but, but to be a state is not enough. It has to be an orlegoyim. It has to do what the Rebbe always said about all governments. They have to be embodiments of morality and justice. And within Israel, you have a special role to play in bringing the religious and non-religious together in, in opening and being accessible, uh, opening the doors of Yiddishkeit to, to all who feel alienated from it. Let me say this uh, final word. I once heard a speech given by a man named Fred Smith, who was the uh, 
founder and CEO of Federal Express, and it was to his employees. And he said to them, the quest for a better company of ours has no final destination. We just have to keep getting better and better. And of course, that was true. But I think you know, and the Rebbe made clear, that in the work that you do, there is a final destination. Um, and you know what it is. It's the day when, as, as Ishayahu Isaiah said, when every valley will be raised, every hill and mountain will be made low. The rugged pass will become smooth and the ridges will become a plain. On that day, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. I want to go back to the uh, Fabrengans that I visited. They were multifaceted experiences, tremendous learning, great joy, and this remarkable exchange between the Rebbe and the Hasidim, looking to catch his eye for a Lachaim, and, and he would go person to person, eyeball to eyeball. And of course, there was more than a Lachaim in that connection. There was affirmation, there was motivation, there was inspiration. Tonight, I hope you um, agree with me that it doesn't take much imagination to imagine that um, we are all, each in our own way, and particularly you shluchim and those who support the work that you do, are looking to catch the Rebbe's eye, uh, to, um, to, to make a lachaim, but more than that, uh, to, to hear the Rebbe's voice, and maybe a smile of pride at the growth that's occurred, but ultimately the Rebbe is saying what you know he would say today, it's wonderful what you've done, but now it's time to go home, and it's time to work harder and harder until that day when the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord. You do that every day. For that, I thank you, and I pray that Hashem will bless you in your work. Thank you very, very much.